probably one of the most influential people in my scientific career, if not my life. And uh, Dave actually, y you saved my life, actually. Um, I was going to study angiosperms, and uh, <laughs> to, the, to the terrible side. Um, so today I'll be speaking with you all about uh, global patterns of fern diversification. <clears throat> and this project sprung up in collaboration with a handful of people who otherwise wouldn't have known each other if it wasn't for Dave, actually. Okay, and the impetus for this project was our desire to determine some of the drivers and global patterns of diversification in ferns. And this led us down an interesting path. Um, and I will say this is part of a larger and ongoing project, and I'm only going to be speaking about part of it with you today. So I'll start with saying that a major goal of biology is to determine what is driving the diversification of life. Uh, why are some clades more species rich than others? Uh, what are the relationships between diversification and biotic and abiotic factors? And what are the biogeographical patterns of species richness, right? Where are most species found? So it's been known for quite some time that uh, particular regions of the world harbor a disproportionate number of species compared to others. And determining if these areas are museums in as much as they have accumulated lineages over a long period of time, or they are cradles in as much as they have accumulated lineages due to recent rapid radiations, has been a topic of debate, <clears throat> and actually empirical work recently is showing that these two hypotheses are not necessarily mutually exclusive. Uh, but if we focus on these rapidly radiating clays, we can ask the question of what is driving their diversification, which many people have and subsequently elucidated some of these p potential drivers. These include latitude, topography, morphological evolution, niche breadth, historical biogeography, and evolutionary key innovations. And of course, this is not an exhaustive list. But I want to focus on some of these drivers that have been emphasized as being important in fern diversification. So in this pioneering paper published about 15 years ago, it was de determined uh, using a time-calibrated phylogeny that, that the majority of extant ferns actually diversified well after the establishment or after the establishment of angiosperm-dominated canopies. So this idea of this novel niche, the angiosperm forest, allowed diversification of, in, of ferns. Uh, subsequent work following up on this emphasized the importance of epiphytes, suggesting that they may be diversifying at a faster rate, so this evolutionary key innovation of epiphytism. Although, recent work using a, a larger tree and newer methods of estimating diversification rates uh, found that terrestrial species and epiphytic species are actually not diversifying at uh, different rates. Additionally, in this paper, they were interested in looking at uh, the rates of morphological evolution, um, as, as a potential driver of diversification in ferns, and they actually did not find that there was any correlation between morphological rates and diversification. And the reason why they looked at this is because this has been emphasized in other lineages as being important. So if we take a finer scale view and look within the Polypodiaceae, um, Sundu and colleagues found, again, that morphological or rates of morphological evolution are decoupled from diversification rates. Rather, it's rates of elevational uh, change are more coupled with uh, diversification rates. And this was hypothesized by Hoffler in a 2000 paper. Um, so the idea here is that the exploration of uh, novel habitats is promoting diversification in, in, in ferns <clears throat> through the exploration of elevation in tropical environments. Um, and additionally, in the Pteridaceae, it was demonstrated that uh, high, high, ele high elevation species of Jamesonia are speciating at faster rates compared to low elevation species. So again, this idea of elevation. Um, and uh, this idea of elevation as being important in diversification is not unique to uh, Pteridaceae and Polypodiaceae. In fact, there's been a myriad of papers that have been published which emphasize the importance of elevation and uh, orogeny as, uh, as an important factor in diversification. Um, most recently by Testo and Emily Sess and Dave, which nicely demonstrate the uh, uh, correlation between the orogeny of the Andes and increased diversification rates in tropical phlegmoriaris. And I'll put a plug for if you want to hear more about that. Uh, Wes will be speaking about that tomorrow, <laughs> tomorrow um, at 8.15 in the IAPT section in Tucson E. <laughs> um, so this is all background to bring us back to the question of what is driving diversification rates in ferns, or what is driving diversification in ferns? Because currently, um, it's uncertain. And instead of trying to... Uh, pull out particular variables, um, we decided to take a more biogeographical approach and ask where are the rapidly radiating species found. 
So if we go to our local library and pull out uh, the Geography Affirmed by Dave Barrington, um, <laughs> <laughs> Sir Hong Peace in 1910, um, we'll see that particular fern floristic regions have been known for a very long time. And this, um, this, this, Dave, you actually uh, cited this in 93... Oh, <laughs> yes. Um, so this paper, or this, this treatise, is actually broken up into two sections. Uh, the first, which outlines the um, impact of uh, edaphic factors and climate and topology on the distribution of fern species, and the second, which is demonstrated in this map, is more of a sort of biogeographical distribution of uh, different fern species. So this idea of um, niche structure as, it, on its, as, it's, as an important factor in the distribution of ferns has been known for a very long time. So if we fast forward half a century from Hermann Kreist's work to a paper published by none other than uh, Rolla Tryon, Dave's major advisor, we'll see that he emphasized particular regions of tropical America as harboring um, many endemics and, and being high in species riches. And the hypothesis here is that these areas are species rich and harbor many endemics because of rapid radiations within these, these hot spots. So if this, if, this is, uh, if this hypothesis is correct, then you would not only uh, see that these areas harbor high species richness and many endemics, but also harbor rapidly radiating lineages. So we wanted to test this on a global scale. So to do that, we used um, the, the phylogenetic tree from Testo and Sundu 2016 um, and, and re-estimating di re -estimated diversification rates using Rev Bayes. We then generated hundreds to thousands of occurrence points for each of the species in that phylogenetic tree using RGBIF. Um, and then what we did is divide the Earth into one degree by one degree grid cells and extracted species richness, endemism, and speciation rates for each of those grid cells. Um, and for the rest of the talk, I'll be speaking about uh, speciation rates, not diversification. So um, we're eliminating an extinction from that. Um, so initially what we did is we took all of our georeferenced occurrence points for all of our species and we plotted them on a map. And then we colored them by increasing speciation rates where um, rapidly radiating lineages are in red. And what you can see, obviously, right off the bat, is that there are two particular regions of the world that harbor rapidly radiating lineages. These are uh, generally high elevation neotropics, or mid to high elevation in the neotropics, and, um, the, uh, and subtropical Asia. So if we take a finer look at the, our neotropical site, qualitatively we can see that um, these areas that harbor rapidly radiating lineages overlap really nicely with Rolla Trion's areas of high species richness and endemism. And if we look at our subtropical Asian site, we see that it overlaps nicely with an area of known biodiversity, which is called the Sino-Japanese floristic region. So this, this map gave us a framework for exploring the data in a more quantitative way, which is what we did. So as I, as I mentioned, um, we extracted species richness, endemism, and mean speciation rates for each of our grid squares. So that's what each of these points are, they're, they're grid squares. Um, and what you can see on a global scale is that areas that harbor high species richness don't necessarily need to harbor many endemics. And this is not surprising because this is perhaps due to the distribution of many widespread species. Similarly, if we look at areas that harbor many endemics, they don't necessarily need to harbor many rapidly radiating uh, lineages. And this is perhaps due to the distribution of relictual endemics that are not rapidly radiating. So this is some like museum hypothesis, right? Although, if we parse out the data and just look at areas of high species richness, we see that when you're in an area of high species richness and high endemism, you, you tend to, have, to harbor rapidly radiating lineages. So this is to say, on a global scale, areas of high species richness and high endemism are probably uh, products of recent rapid radiations, or, or cradles. So we wanted to look into our uh, diversification hotspots and, hotspots and ask if these questions persist. So if we look in the neotropics, we see that, yes, in areas of high species richness, you tend to harbor many endemic lineages. And similarly, in areas where there are many endemic lineages, you tend to harbor rapidly radiating lineages. So this is to say that in the neotropics, at least, um, uh, uh, areas of hotspots of biodiversity are products of recent rapid radiations, as Rolla Tryon hypothesized. Although, when we look in the Sino-Japanese floristic region, these trends are not as strong. So this is to say that in areas of high species richness, you don't necessarily need to harbor many endemic lineages. Um, which, and this is perhaps due to the distribution of many widespread species. I mean, this is not unique to our data set. This is actually found in many other lineages that um, areas of species richness and endemism are not always correlated. 
Similarly, if you look at areas with many uh, endemics in the Sino-Japanese floristic region, you don't necessarily need to harbor many rapidly radiating lineages. So this is perhaps due to the distribution of relictual endemics. And it's known that in the Sino-Japanese floristic region, during the last glacial maximum, there were many areas that were um, not glaciated. Um, and in many other groups, uh, particularly vascular plant or uh, spermatophytes and, and angiosperms, um, the, this, this, this biodiversity hotspot is home to many relictual endemics, which are not rapidly radiating. So that's uh, perhaps why you get this trend. So sort of to summarize what I just said, in the neotropics, it seems like our areas of bi our biodiversity hotspots are products of recent rapid radiations. I mean, there are many, many narrow endemics, um, and as Rolotron hypothesized. But in our uh, Sino-Japanese floristic region, uh, perhaps the distribution of widespread species is, uh, is governing um, the er these areas of species richness, and perhaps there are many relictual endemics, and the processes in this area are a little more complex. So, uh, with the data that I just showed you, um, I hope that you're convinced that we've um, uh, determined some of the global patterns of diversification in ferns. But this still doesn't get at the question of what is driving diversification in ferns. Right? We've just identified some of these hotspots harboring rapidly radiating lineages. Um, but what's unique about these two areas is that they're actually uh, very heterogeneous in their, uh, in, their niche, in their niches. So there's a lot of niche heterogeneity in a very, in a very small geographic range. Um, and over the past um, uh, 10 to 20 uh, million years, there's been um, rapid either climatic or uh, topologic uh, oscillation or, or orogeny, so particularly in the Hangduan Mountain region and in the Andes. And it's been demonstrated in, in many other lineages that some metric of niche heterogeneity could be a potential driver of diversification. So it may be that within ferns, um, niche heterogeneity, and thus the exploration of novel habitats, is driving diversification. Although we have many more analyses to run to really narrow that hypothesis down. <clears throat> so, uh, in conclusion, I want to say that we've identified two major hotspots um, which ha that harbor rapidly radiating lineages and ferns. These are generally neotropical highlands, and the second are, is the Sino-Japanese floristic region. Um, second is that it seems that in the, neotropi in the neotropics, our biodiversity uh, and our, our biodiversity hotspots are products of recent rapid radiations, as we're all trying to hypothesize. Um, although in the Sino-Japanese floristic region, it may be that the uh, distribution of widespread species uh, governs uh, species richness, and many relictual endemics are um, skewing our trends between endemism and, and speciation rates. And finally, although we need to run more analyses, um, it could be that niche heterogeneity and, and habitat exploration, as Chris Hoffler hypothesized with the Polypodiaceae back in 2000, uh, may be driving diversification rates uh, in ferns, or driving diversification in ferns. Um, so with that, I have many people and organizations to uh, thank. Um, if you want to contact me, you can hit that up. But most importantly, uh, I really want to thank Dave Barrington. You know, as I said in the beginning, he's been one of the most um, important and influential people in my in my scientific and in my scientific life and in my life in general. And I just it's an honor to be speaking here on your behalf. And uh, thank you. Mm -hmm.